Hello, everybody, and welcome to another week of Try Hard Tuesdays, where we learn to try a little bit harder and hopefully smarter. Um, I am your host, the Grand Wazoo. Joining me today, or tonight, are uh, my co-hosts, Mr. Blue 22 and uh, we have a special guest for the duration of the episode as a co-host, and that's uh, Gorgon. Welcome, Gorgon. Hey, thanks. It's my pleasure to be here for a little bit longer this week. Yeah, yeah, we've liked you. You know, we took you out on a couple short dates, and they were a lot of fun. We sat in the park and talked Dota. And yeah, we, we we knew that we liked each other. We didn't know if we like liked each other. Exactly. And, you know, a little bit of feeding the pigeons, and we got there. Now it's dinner and a movie, and we're going to um, be discussing the majors because, I mean, it's very topical. So, uh, Blue, how are you doing? What have you been up to? I'm good. I'm good. I've been... Uh... Going back to my pub roots, been playing a lot of uh, Ember Spirit, um, trying to emulate my Ii Sama, but uh, it has gone well. I'm not Ii Sama yet, but that's okay. I'm working on it. That's bullshit. You worked on that for like six hours, probably. Fuck off. All right? <laughs> Fuck off. This guy it's gave a lot his harder life than up. It looks, man. Um, so I mean, majors are definitely really topical for everybody. I mean, it was a exciting magical tournament i will even go far like not a lot can get me going at like four in the morning three in the morning um and still be up like buzzing from that excitement it was a really well-ran tournament um there was barely any mistakes i mean they did have some weird things like they would uh give a caster's name wrong or something but other than that i mean that's just nitpicky stuff and it just kind of showed me where this game's going, and it's uh, it's not slowing down. At least my hype train is not slowing down. It's um, it's going up, and I I can see that there's a lot of there's a lot of potential for the game, um, even when you think that there's not more advantages that can be kind of eked out. We see these new uh, little ways that you can slice off a little bit extra of the pie. So that's what we're going to be discussing today, really, in our. Uh, try hard way is um, those kind of interesting meta things that we saw and um, we'll be kind of using that to illustrate some of our points Um, how'd you guys like the tournament i thought it was i thought it was a really well-run tournament i thought it had a lot of good narratives in it obviously um team og winning is uh spoiler alert (laughs) is a a good good deal for me because they are my the the team that i root for since they were monkey business i've i've been kind of following them uh I really, really like Tall, uh, Fly, who is their captain as a drafter. I really, really like him as a player. Um, not not to offset any of the other talents on that team, but they all have good attitudes. They all approach the game with a really interesting perspective. And I'm interested to see really how they move into 6.86 when the patch lands probably mid-December. Because I'm suspecting that they're going to have to really adapt when the new patch lands. That's my suspicion. Yeah, it not, feels not like um, this kind of meta was really good for Notel in particular, just because he was able to. He wasn't on that many heroes. I mean, his hero pool was rather limited, but he had a good like rock paper scissors variety between the PL and the gyro, and I mean, he played some other stuff. But he had something where he could either escape or like farm really quick, and so it it really benefited that team I felt like, and they were just so consistent in a way, like in their mindset and their play that it really showed that they're kind of, they've done the work. I mean, no tell has been around forever. So what did you think of the tournament blue? I loved it from front to back. Really. It, um, you know, you saw a lot of shifting lanes going on. You saw a lot of picks that, you know, there was a weird, like the phrase cheesy strats came up a lot during the panelist discussion, which kind of threw me off because, I don't know, to me, these are really, um, they're not necessarily novel strats, but they're not strats that are used very commonly in really, really high level competitive Dota. And it was cool to see them busted out. It's cool to see Huskar really come into his own. Um, it's cool to see Alchemist and not just, you know, your standard, Octo- your now standard. Octarine Core Manta style split pushy kind of build on him. Uh, it was it was really interesting to see 
the emphasis on Tusk and a lot of fighting heroes and the the lane swapping and and you know dual lanes mid tiny pulling the mid lane. I mean, I'm previewing a lot of stuff that we're going to get into, but it was really cool to see the variety of strategies used and and seeing that um, it wasn't just one team bringing some one new thing to the table and wiping everyone off the map with it, you know? Uh, which I, I, which yeah, oh, can be ahead, seen in some tournaments. Go ahead. I, I, I was just going to say, I also took issue with the amount that the analysts were calling strategies cheese strats. Not just on OG, but in general. To me, yeah. what a cheese strategy is when, we, when you're going into fondue territory is when you start to see a strategy pulled out that can only win in a very specific circumstance, and usually that circumstance is your opponents don't know that you're going to do it. Like, it catches them off guard because it's weird, and it only works because of its novelty. That wasn't the case for almost anything done in the tournament, except arguably, potentially, the support Tiny played by Pilei Die for Secret. Maybe that I would qualify as cheese, but the Huskar Dazzle, that's certainly I would not qualify that as a cheese strat. And nothing that OG ran, I, I wouldn't qualify that as a cheese strat any more than I would qualify IO Tiny as a cheese strat or uh, Beastmaster Darkseer as a cheese strat, right? Like, mm -hmm. these are just hero combinations that work well. I mean, I don't even think you can call some of their strategies pocket strats. I mean, because they just kind of, they picked heroes you see often, or Fly was able to draft something really strange that you don't think would be able to work out. As yeah. well it did, as it did, and it just kind of like takes the other team apart. <clears throat> so I, I would definitely and anything where they run Meepo that that's a pocket strategy. That's something that they keep in their back pocket that they're forcing their opponents to deal with. They're forcing out bans because they know, but they run it very rarely. That's the sort of thing that I would consider pocket strategy personally. Go on. Yeah, no, I I definitely agree. Um, so they have like a couple of those strategies, but overall it was just really consistent play. They did a lot of different things that um, really changed my mind on the game. I mean, I think as you get into a meta, like, if there's things you don't like about it, you're more capable to, like, I don't know, like, over-exaggerate it in your mind about how bad. Like, I, I don't know, this meta isn't good for me because I was, like, the certain man-fighting type hero that was more, like, kind of last meta. And so, like, I got all my, all my skills are kind of, like, there, you know? And so now this new meta where it's way focused on fighting, sure, but... It's also a lot of like eking out those really small advantages and kind of like um, just really tightening up in a lot of ways, which I'm not very good at discipline wise. But well, also, I mean, th this is I, not to get too try hardy, try hardy on try hard Tuesday, but that is the pro level, like the the pinnacle of Dota, yeah. all time Dota execution. We're talking about the most competitive field of teams, other than arguably the teams before TI five, right? Playing. For $3 million, like, the meta there, people emulate it at every level, but if you are sub 5k and you're not playing with a group of people you know, it's it's not going to be representative of what you have to do to win, or even what might be good for you to win. And I don't want to get off because I know we're talking about the, the major primarily, but just because people are seeing a certain amount of eking out advantage through very minor things, that's what Pro Dota is, right? Pro Dota is a group of players that play at such a high theoretical and technical level that every minor advantage counts when it comes down to whether or not you got a centaur camp or you got a golem camp like that makes a difference at the pro level it doesn't make a difference at most levels of pub play yeah it really doesn't i mean to an extent like i think it's emulated and that's the biggest way that it <laughs> might ever have an impact is people trying all those new heroes i mean i've seen ember in like the past three games i've played now yeah he's, he's a hero that's uh kind of dripped back in because of uh the old eternal envy but um i don't know it, it does feel like uh just with the patches and how things are nerfed i mean that does influence what's played and um what for people sure. will kind of um, call you stupid for playing sometimes even to that extent but I definitely agree with you on that um, we were seeing the highest points of play and so we're going to talk about a couple things that we saw that um, interested us about that and that'll kind of be the next leg of the conversation starting with um, lanes I feel like um, it was really interesting to see like uh, an off lane ran in the safe lane against an off lane and um, having uh you know, the carry ran in the off lane in the first little bit until space could be made, and then he'd be ported down to the safe lane, and then he would have his farm good to go. And also, um, not as many tri-lanes in this tournament. So 
I would like to talk about those three major things, um, kind of the lane, uh, the malleability of the lane, um, kind of what it means to even be getting farm when you might be getting locked out and not taking that risk, as well as uh, the tri lane and how uh, it's kind of moving towards that mid support on the uh, getting supported by one of the supports and uh, the other one down the lane. So um, we'll talk about that first. What do you guys think about that? Did you see anything in the tournament that blew your minds along that yeah, regard? I think for me, one of the big things is just seeing the just how popular it it was to have a dual lane the first three, four minutes in the mid lane for, for both of the, the mid laners to have a support on their side, just either harassing or zoning, um, stacking the jungle right next to them, then going back to harassing. I mean, we've seen it before where the emphasis has been on the mid. We talked about it post TI5, how, you know, there'd be a lot of stacking for flash farming, but I don't think I've seen it just to this um, extent, seeing the number of, you know, Winter Wyverns plus Shadow Fiends in a lane to help secure, uh, you know, the, everyone five manning the room for Alk is very common, but having someone in the lane in addition, you know, to, to support the Alk the first couple levels, it just really felt like um, there was, it's hard, you can't call them a roaming support, but they would, they'd be like a, a in two minute chunks, they would move from lane to lane to help secure either the carries lane or the mids lane. And like you said, there there wasn't as much tri laning and and very traditional tri laning going on. Um, and another thing that you mentioned was you know just having uh, a carry who can kind of sustain himself a little more like a gyrocopter, putting him in the off lane so you can ser secure some early levels for your off lane. I don't know a a dual or a one v one off lane role with a, a earthshaker and a tusk or something like that. It was very interesting to see the kind of equilibrium of farm. Uh, kind of balance itself out a little more at the early stages, at least. Um, so I thought that was the most fascinating part of it. I don't know. What about you, Oren? So this is maybe a little bit before your guys' time in terms of, like, the cycle that is Dota. Uh, but the dual mid lane sort of thing has a tendency to pop up when IOs are popular. For, for very obvious reasons that Io is a hero who can run a bottle very effectively as a support. He is able to stack pretty effectively and get back to lane quickly with the tether. And he makes a mid laner essentially impossible to harass, right? So we saw a bit of this also sometime around 2013, though I forget exactly what part of the year it was. I think it was late 2013, but it might have been mid-2013, just before the International that year. Um, and and it, it mimicked... The game is obviously very different now than it was then. But, but what we're seeing here with the dual mids uh, did kind of mimic what we saw then as well in, in IO's last major resurgence of popularity. Was um, that the team with Fnatic? They always ran Tiny IO. That was like their strat. Yeah, there were a lot of teams back then that were running. Like it was, right. it was even more than now, where some teams are doing it fairly frequently. Like Vega does it, as does obviously OG. Um, back then, it was e even more prevalent. Um, but but what it what it really forces to a certain degree is it forces your opponent's mid laner to decide: Do I lose this lane? And do we run a roaming support to try and take out the offlaner? Or do we sacrifice mid lane experience to try and match eye to eye this dual mid lane? Which is usually not a great call either, unless you planned it from the draft. Now, drafters are a lot more savvy now than they were in 2013 to what's going on. Uh, the drafts are, are getting increasingly impressive, I think, that the top drafters in the world. PPD, your puppies, your Qs, and of, of course your flies. Um, so they are, when they see that the IO is a potential, a lot of times what you will see is a ranged hero will come out in the mid lane and a support that's able to go into the jungle and stack and then semi support in the mid will also pick up for that flexibility as an option. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that is an interesting trend. We definitely saw a lot more of, of that dual mid lane. We, we saw, I think it was probably the third most run laning configuration of the tournament. 
maybe the fourth, actually, now that I think about it. So I, I, I looked at these stats the other day. I'm not looking at them right now. I wish I were. But most common is still going to be uh, your dual safe lane. And then second most common is still going to be your solo mid lane. So third most common was probably your standard tri lane, which means fourth most common, yeah, dual lane. I'm confident that that is the order for first. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, you know, I've seen a lot of IO plus one mm -hmm. in the mid lane, and that's pretty common. But seeing other heroes that, that are less traditional dual mid laners, like, for sure. you know, um, well, I guess now it's more traditional since TI5, but Winter Wyvern starting out in the uh, mid lane, Dazzle a lot of times would be there. Uh, you'd have even you just have Bane to just harass yep. some Bane people. Bane is great, out. great, great in the in the mid lane as a dual hero. Yeah, and and you know as you talked about um, a couple weeks back, Bane really made. I mean, he had a big. I wouldn't even say resurgence because he you know he had a little time I guess with the the Marana Bane arrow era, um, but um, he seemed to really come back in this, and he really seemed to be a really um, important and effective. Uh, support that just kind of helped dominate these lanes. He's he's an interesting character, and I know we talked about him a lot, but I just wanted to get your take on how teams ran him in the mid lane and why is he so effective in that lane. So, yeah, the, we haven't actually seen a lot of Bane since, uh, once again, that late 2013 era, honestly. Um, it's the last time we saw a whole bunch of him. And one of the reasons that he's really good in that mid lane is because he is sustainable, right? Because he has that brain sap now, especially with the uh, buffs to brain sap that came out recently. He's able to go into the jungle and stack effectively. He is able to go and harass effectively in the mid lane and to get all of his health back with one last final push using that brain sap and pulling away. If you do need to, you can get some of that in feeble and try to help offset the advantage that your opponent gets. Usually, if you're running a Bane as a duel in the mid, it means your opponent has an IO, probably an IO Alchemist, an IO Tiny, something like that. Um, just historically. Uh, usually, IO gets paired up with strength mids that are melee heroes, right? So, those heroes are very hard to harass, especially with the IO, and it makes it very difficult for their opponents to stop them from actually getting any goddamn last hits, right? So in order to make it more difficult to last hit, that Enfeeble can be a really useful spell. Although you don't see it that much in the professional level of play. Partially because it doesn't provide you as much for roaming gank potential. And partially because the difference that a level 1 Enfeeble makes on a pro player's ability to last hit is much less significant than the difference that it makes at a, a pub level of play. Because those players are so technically savvy, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you can throw a hero that has a hard time, like, last hitting early, maybe like a Shadow Fiend or something. And <laughs> with that Bane on there, just with that little bit of extra... Um, pressure. Pressure, it can just yeah. really ruin your day. And <laughs> so you, it's like, I, I was seeing it, like, and viewing it like a game of risk. It's like if you put two guys on the border of, like, South America, like, you're going to want two guys back there sometimes, you know? But it, yeah. it's that decision of just do I rotate over or do I not and just hopefully he can make it. And like I I don't know, it, it felt like a huge gamble. Do you view that like not rotating is a better choice? I mean earlier you mentioned that rotating over and doing the 2v2 with the EXP sap is not maybe the best idea in the mid lane. What do you think a good response to that is? It's really difficult. If you have not calculated that your opponent might dual mid in the draft, then it's very difficult to deal with it. So here are your basic options, right? You can have a mid laner who can clear out jungle stacks so that even though he is going to, in theory, fall behind his opponent, he is going to be able to catch up on jungle stacks, and then he will be ahead in both gold and experience. That's one method. And so you see that with, like, Shadow Fiends, sometimes mm -hmm. Queens of Pain, right? Queen of Pains? What, however you pluralize that, right? <laughs> the, the other option that you have in terms of really big options, it really punish you, smash the other lanes. Do not let them take any advantage at all. You get a very aggressive tri-lane in your safe situation, and you absolutely zone the living hell out of their, uh, their offlaner, right? You don't let them get anywhere near creeps. You make him fall behind so that all those jungle stacks at the dual mid are putting together with their IO, to, with their fancy little maneuvers, the tethering back into the lane, and they get this nice jungle stack going, their off laner has to go and clear those up instead of the mid laner because he's so far behind that that's the only way to catch him back up. That resets, it helps even out the advantage 
that that dual mid lane gives you. So if you do that effectively enough, what you'll end up with is an overleveled mid laner because your opponents have been splitting experience and equivalent off laner. So you can actually win out that lane. The other way is to uh, leave your safe laner kind of alone and then roam your supports out very uh, efficiently and try to gank the off lane typically. It's difficult to gank a dual lane mid because there's two of them and they tend to be very survivable. And if you do manage to kill one, it's usually the Io, which typically doesn't really matter that much anyway. So usually the off lane is, is the hero that you would want to gank and or, or their safe lane, your off lane, right? Yeah. But it's difficult to get your supports all the way from your safe lane to the other side of the map in a timely manner without losing a ton of experience. Get that kill on somebody who should have a support with him as well and should be waiting for this because, once again, in theory, this is one of the ways to counter that dual mid lane. So your farming carry is typically keeping his eyes out for those kind of rotations. But th there are other ways to do it. For example, running a dual lane of your own in mid, which is also a moderately common way to handle it if you've predicted it in the draft. But I would say that historically, those are the three most effective ways. Yeah, I, I, there's another method, though, one that we touched on a little bit that we didn't talk about. What's that? I mean, you can pull the mid lane. That's that, that's, that's one the, way. That's the old tiny toss pulling the mid lane. Yeah, they used and, to do uh, that with IO, actually. The IO, mm -hmm. so, so the radiant side camp that actually has its pull time changed and you can't really stack it. And then they did it to the dire side camp as well to even it out. But you used to be able to use the IO tether to knock down the trees between the radiant jungle and the radiant mid lane. And then IO would just be able to drag one of those camps straight into the mid lane. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just another way to do that. This, uh, the secret IO tiny or uh, so, IO. So for those, the, yeah. for those who haven't seen it, um, can you just give it a, a brief 15 second, you know, explanation of what the mechanics were behind it and, and who did it? Yeah, so for Team Secret, they ran Pylai Dai as a semi-support tiny. Well, not semi-support, a support tiny, who would go into the jungle, walk up to the very first southernmost camp, and use vision of his own creeps to toss one of the neutrals back to his creeps, which would then aggro onto the neutral as it ran back to its home, and he would pull the mid lane like that. By the way, this is something that you can also do with Tuscar, and you can also do with Pudge. Um, you see this done with Pudge sometimes by Team Leviathan, whose Jenkins is arguably the best semi-pro slash pro um, uh, Pudge player in the world. And, and I've also seen it with Tuscar in professional games before as well. You can pull, you pull the creeps out a little bit, then block their path back with the ice shards, and then they walk all the way around and, and they aggro. It's easiest with oh. Tiny, though. It's hmm. easiest with Tiny to do. Interesting. Yeah, and that's not a lot of something i'd ever seen you know really yeah. um you see it every once in a while but it's a niche strategy for sure yeah Ar and arguably if, cheese yeah yeah if you run that one up against a dual mid lane that i mean i think that one punishes them even more as long as they aren't able to successfully dive you because you know whatever experience they do get out of it is cut in half again because it's a dual lane and two seriously under leveled you know guys in the middle lane make for a pretty easy yank two or three minutes down the road, at least, you know, ideally. Um, so I thought that was a really cool strat, and I think that's one that, you know, a lot of people in their pub games will want to try out just to see how it feels, um, you know, as the tiny. You know, do you think um, it's something that you might, you know, want to consider if you have a little five stack and you want to have a little fun, try that out? So here is this. I think this strategy is widely misunderstood, and let me explain why it works so well the first game because you'll remember they ran it twice right they ran yep. it once it against not evil existed. geniuses yeah i think and once against vici gaming both of whom are about equivalently skilled teams um and it worked brilliantly the first time mm -hmm. and really poorly the second time and they almost lost that second game but managed to come back because of the success of their other lanes right that strategy was so effective specifically because it was countering not a dual mid lane, but because it was countering a mid alchemist. And not, not just a mid alchemist, arguably the sure. world's best mid alchemist, super, super from, yeah. from Beachy Gaming. When you are cutting alchemist access to last hits, you are cutting more than his experience and his GPM. You are significantly cutting his ability to window at the right time. By that I mean you're cutting his, his advantage, which is his Greeble's Greed Gold as a carry or as a core, 
when he manages to get those last hits, that is what his hero is based on. So if you're denying him that, he doesn't end up getting online faster than your own cores. An alchemist equal to other cores is very much weaker than those other cores. He needs the gold advantage, which is why he often comes out so weak if he gets ganked. This is a safer way to do that kind of ganking, or an easier way to do that ganking, by essentially just lowering his GPM. And I, I ran the numbers, but depending on how good of a day Super was doing last hitting, that would be between a 70 and a 140 GPM drop for the first 10 minutes, the tiny mm -hmm. pulls, right? So against Super in that situation, you're talking the first 10 minutes, you're cutting his net worth by, what, like 1,000, maybe 1,400? That is wildly significant. Now, if you're yeah. doing it against a normal mid laner, it's not as big of a deal. And the other thing is, if you are doing it against a dual mid, it makes it safer for them to push into your jungle and not only take those creeps back, but also Contest, now take yeah. the neutral camp. And also throw your tiny away from experience range. So it is very dangerous. I would not necessarily... Uh, recommend it if you don't fully understand all of the nuances of why it was used in that matchup for five stacks, because I feel like in a lot of situations, what you're going to end up with is a disenchanted game where your opponents just kind of charge into your jungle and punish you on it. And then your support, your third support is forced to rotate mid and then your farming carry and your offlane are going to fall behind because they don't have support. And the whole thing just kind of collapses from under you if your opponents know how to handle it. Yeah, I was going to say, then it depends on them successfully entering your jungle without vision right. and, you know, not having and assuming that there's not going to be a support on your side backing up waiting for that to happen. So, I mean, it could happen, but maybe if you have a hero like, you know, Tusk on your team, mm -hmm. um, it can happen. Segway. There Tusk. you go. Rise, there we go. I guess he might have risen a while ago, but he has like stood atop his ice pedestal for that amount of time. So he's a very good hero. Um, he is just kind of all around good. I mean, he's good at dislocation. He's good at getting people out of trouble. I mean, there were some awesome snowball plays like where people just clicked on it at the right time and avoided instant death. And um, I don't know. He uh, has a great presence. So I guess we can kind of talk about the off lane a little bit more and then we'll kind of transition into the safe lane starting with tusk so what did, what did you guys see from him anything mind-blowing not just off lane but also support i think that's maybe that's why like both he and um and you know you saw a lot of earthshaker not just on moon meander but a lot of uh, a lot of people actually so wh why do you think those guys came back into the f well tusk has always been popular in the past i don't know for a, for a while at least um but why do you think guys like um, Earthshaker um, were so effective. Just, just in general, as a broad sweeping statement, I, I would say that they were effective because the players who played them effectively knew what they were doing. You know, uh, so uh, on this patch, Earthshaker is slightly negative overall, but in this tournament specifically, he was one of the five most effective heroes. He was fourth. Um, so. He provides a lot for that AOE potential, that team fight potential. He provides a lot for a fallback on the late game. In the draft, he doesn't give away your strategy because he can be run as both a support and an offlaner. We didn't see any of the serious crit shaker going mm -hmm. on this tournament, but you also do potentially have that fallback as well uh, in the draft. So he doesn't give away a whole lot in the draft, and draft is very important in this specific uh, patch of Dota where everything is going to happen so fast and the aggression is going to be heaped on so early in the game that you don't have a lot of times to adjust your plan before it's already under fire. When you do have faster paced games like these, it, it makes such a big difference for your opponents to not be able to predict your lanes or predict your uh, early game strategy before they see it, or at least before they choose their heroes. Because then you're not losing some of that advantage in the first 10 minutes. That ends up becoming vital for your 20-minute success rate. Yeah. That's... So I, I, on the flip side, sorry to, sorry to cut you no off. Problem. On the flip side, we talk about, um, you know, I feel like everyone has been bitching about Wind Ranger lately and how overpowered and really, really good she is. I mean, as of this tournament, her win percentage, I think it was like 40%. It was uh, miserable, yeah. Yeah, wh why was... Why would she... What was the difference? I mean, was it just that the shackles weren't landing and it was dependent on that? Is it that her 
her role isn't defined well enough. Her item build is just a little too, you know, greedy to start the, the typical, you know, I guess. Do they still consider it the slasher's way build where it's agonims first? I feel yeah, like, I, I think know. the ags first makes sense because you're in a metagame where very aggressive movement is the way you want to play. And that ags allows you to chip push, right? It allows you to always engage onto a tower or onto a rax with focus fire. So that makes a lot of sense. So Wind Ranger, first of all, I don't think she's ever been, uh, at least not this patch, as strong as people have given her credit for. Just, just you know, general population. I think that her value has been overstated um, because of the success of some very strong players like Weeha. The other thing is that a lot of heroes that directly counter her uh, have been popular. They, you've got big strength heroes with burst damage like Tiny and Alchemist coming out. That Those heroes are not easy for Wind Ranger to handle. You have heroes like Winter Wyvern and Bane that are able to just offset her, her focus fire entirely and just reset the fight, either with a Nightmare or with a uh, Cold Embrace. So, overall, I would say that she's just kind of been zoned out of the draft value. Now, granted, Weeha still ran that hero massively valuable to, to Secret all, throughout the entire tournament, but, but nobody else actually had a very successful run, basically, with Wind Ranger through the whole tournament. Her win rate was really insanely low. I, it was, uh, other than Secret, below 30%. Like, it was very bad. I don't know. Wazir, did you see any Wind Ranger play other than Weeha that really stood out to you? Not off the top at all. Of I mean, even all yeah. the highlights running around throughout the tournament where Weeha, like that whole illusion uh, thing he did, mm -hmm. where he saw the smoke coming because of the disrupted movement. Like, it, even all that kind of stuff, it was just like, it was all Weeha um, in terms of Wind Ranger. And she's a very high skill ceiling hero. I mean, she's... She's someone who has a lot of good applicability if you know how to use her, and so that would make sense that someone who has the amount of games Weeha does um, yeah. would have success with her, while others have not. But um, I would agree with that. Um, I kind of want to talk about the offlane while we still have time, and that's um, one thing is running the offlane hero. You know, I think we saw like Clockworks ran in uh, safe lane and stuff like that, and even Tusks at times, and they just kind of roam after that. But also the idea of running an offlane against an offlane. Um, so the offlane and the safe lane against their offlane. Yeah. And um, running the carry. And you saw OG do this quite a bit up in, in, in the offlane until he gets, they get some levels and then they switch it up. Yeah. So what, what's this melee ability of lanes? I mean, like so much of Dota you've seen, like you have them in there. Typically people will know what they're going to lane. And then like if they mind switch, it'll be like a mid with something else. Like I, I rarely recall seeing you know, offlanes ran against the opposing offlanes so often than I have in this tournament. Yeah, it, it feels like it was definitely matchup-based, but, I mean, to contrast from other tournaments, I, I don't know, it feels like they were very much ready to pull the trigger and change the lanes at a moment's notice just because, you know, just because it the because the matchups were so emphasized. Is that why? Is there Was there other outside factors, do you think, that went into this? Yeah, so one of the factors that I think is the most important for determining this aspect of the strategy that teams are employing is that they are planning, for the most part, the successful teams. So uh, definitely Vega, who actually weren't that successful, but they, they, did, they did all right. But OG, to a large degree, Secret, not as much for EG, but even EG, CDEC, um, a lot of these teams... They are, like I had said before, being extremely aggressive through the early game, which means that they're going to have roaming supports, and their carry is going to have to, to be able to contribute earlier. So what that basically means is that they're picking carries or picking builds that don't require as much time or as much farm, which means they don't need to keep that carry as safe. And because they don't need to keep that carry as safe, they can afford to roam the supports, into other lanes. They can afford to do a 2-1-1 uh, with a roamer or a 1-1-1 with two roamers. So the value that they get out of those supports around the map in terms of general control goes up, and their goal is to really keep their opponent from getting anything rather than getting a whole bunch themselves. And as the offset of that, they end up getting a higher GBM because they're taking earlier towers and, and they're getting more kills. This is something that I think we've been seeing hinted at honestly since 6.83 uh 
when those AOE gold changes from 6.82 last year were kind of walked back just a touch. So that kills were worth way more than they had ever been worth before in Dota. But the comeback mechanics were no longer so significant that you could just plan for the late game all the time. If you remember like ESL 1 New York 2014, mm -hmm. that was what every game was. It felt like it was 60 minutes because every team was just like, well, I'll have a Terror Blade and they'll have an Anti-Mage and we'll just go for the latest game victory we possibly can. Um, since they got those comeback mechanics under control, though, the kills are worth a lot more gold than they used to be. Supports can honestly, they can sustain themselves on kill gold and assist gold if they are successful. Uh, especially if you have supports that are like Bounty Hunter, who tends to go out and not really care too much how much gold he has because he has that comeback mechanic of the track. He just cares about getting his levels and keeping his opponents off base, keeping his opponents from getting their farm. You know, it's interesting. I think you were on uh, some .p show after TI5, and I remember you mentioning that it was going to be a more uh, support-centric meta. Yeah. And it feels like it has been. I mean, you saw EG win TI5 with their support play, and I, in a lot of ways, like, um, OG was a team built upon the supports. and then, For um, sure. You know, it felt like No Tail was pretty a stagnant part of the team. Although he's he's a really strong player, like don't get me wrong, but like his hero pool and everything like that. Um, so it's interesting to see that develop. It feels like a broader, more interesting game. It feel like it feels like it has more depth for all roles than it perhaps did a couple patches ago. But um, at all stages, yeah, yeah, at all stages, that's for sure. Um, from laning phase to the late game, it it feels like it has more breadth. I guess would be the word. And, um, so every every strategy that we used to see used to be variations of four protect one, right? There were like twelve common variations of four protect one. I pulled that number out of my butt, but there used to be some large number of four protect one strategies where you would see various laning configurations, and the whole design of those configurations were to get your carry as much farm as possible. And China excels at this specifically, by the way. And now what we're seeing a lot more of is priority on vision priority on area control and priority on aggression and those three factors are all support factors right you you get your area control your vision and your aggression out of the heroes that don't need to be in the lane you get them from your roamers you get them from your hero second tp and one of the reasons i would argue that og have been so successful is because for example fly if he does play out of the off lane will immediately rotate as soon as there is potential to get a kill. He is always ready to go, as are most of the players on uh, OG. And this is the same thing that you saw people so wowed about when CDEC did very well at TI. And Aggressive would, at nine minutes, rotate out of his lane to bully somebody in the off lane because he can, because he saw an opportunity to get a kill. We're seeing those rotations and that aggression become increasingly valuable. And I suspect that we'll see that walked back a touch with the changes that are made on 6.86, but I don't know that for sure because I don't work with Ice Frog, right? That, yeah, that sounds like that's a whole other uh, Try Hard Tuesday episode, is 6.86 yeah, uh, predictions. But um, I think you're right, and I think the the like perfect indicator of this kind of, you know, um, this kind of style of play is when you see... I think it was sometime in the finals where you see an alchemist trying to get a bounty rune, uh, a Rubik trying to um, deny him that rune, and then you see your gyrocopter, your carry gyrocopter from the off lane roam all the way over to go help and get that bounty rune for his carry and get his first blood on the Rubik who denied it. And you're like, what in the, is this even Dota anymore? If you go back to like, you know, two, three years ago. And you look at your, you know, your very traditional tri laning for protect one, and then you look at this, you're like, is this like a 2K pub game, you know? It's just such a, like, the whole style of the game has changed in such a dramatic way. And, and yes, there's been odes to, to previous, um, you know, previous metas and, and previous styles, but I just don't remember seeing such a, such a wonky, like, anyone can, you know, get as, anyone can have as high a, as net worth as your offlaner if you're a support, if you get a couple kills rolling. It just felt like a very... You know, I mean, even the pros were talking about how it felt a little pubby almost. Um, you you see a tinker get picked up. I mean, when where were you seeing that guy past six point eight three? Um, you know, you see all these all these interesting weird picks. Uh, we talked. I mean, 
the dot p guy the, the uh through craft thursday guys talked about how traditionally not picking your your supports first and second picks is not great and then you see in the finals that these uh supports like dazzle and winter wyvern are emphasized so heavily uh that they're picked in the first two by og twice uh so it's so cool to see that the support play like you said is standing out and that the support picks are emphasized just as much if not more so than than the carry picks um because of you know the strength of their power and also the the flexibility of a lot of different carries that you can kind of mix and match with them yeah um I- I think those two heroes are like huge for the tournament, Wyvern and Dazzle. Um, it's not hard to see why. Um, but <laughs> Bringing you, it back to our, our .p games, it's, those are our picks, baby. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, they're really strong. Uh, Wyvern just endlessly applicable to all sorts of different situations. He's become that support that everyone wants, and I'm glad for that. Um, that really does answer my question for that segment. I mean... I just don't remember having my mind so thoroughly blown, and maybe it's just because I'm starting to understand the game better, and I can kind of rationalize why they make some of these decisions, even though I'll never know, you know? Like, I can kind of be like, okay, they're doing this probably because of this, you know, and who knows if I'm right or wrong, but... No, I... I, I this is a good stage for you to be... I, I remember being in that stage of Dota, right, where I was starting... I had a good understanding of the mechanics, I knew what all the heroes did, and I started to watch Pro Dota... And I started to kind of feel like I was seeing a lot more and my eyes were opening and it always felt like all of a sudden it felt like I was seeing new stuff all the time that had not been seen before. Uh, And you will perpetually feel like that. The, The better you become at understanding what's happening, the more you will feel like you are seeing new and subtle and interesting differences patch to patch to patch to patch to patch. And I remember... Like, the first time a tri-lane was ever introduced to me as a concept. Now that that blew, it blew my mind. And I've been playing Dota since, like, 2006 or 2007. And that wasn't even made until competitive Dota really started to hit. You know, like, back then, tri-lanes, it was 2-1-2 almost all the time. And then, uh, I think it was Milk who coached one of his teams, like, to start applying more pressure in one lane and using the jungle you leveraging the jungle in such a way to give that carry such an advantage and we have honestly seen that era of tri lane last for a long time but once again since th- that post 6.82 world i think we're seeing that progressively fall off a bit not to the point that i would ever expect it to be a less or a minority of games i still think that we are going to continue to see that tr- safe lane tri lane as a majority of the games but we are seeing a lot more diversity of the other 49% or whatever of games that are played. It just makes sure. completely different games, which is really nice. Yeah. I mean, the, depending upon the configuration of lane, uh, it's very interesting. You know, I am to that point where it's like I'll get a draft right every once in a while and it'll feel like I got like a hard question on Jeopardy or something. It's just <laughs> like, yes, it's like you're welcome, Red Eye. For the help um but <laughs> it's just i'm to that point where like sometimes i know what to do you know like 10 percent out of the time of the time and these are guys that know what to do it feels like 90 to 95 percent of the time and so it's just nice to see the game still growing i can't grow at that speed you know it's not even remotely possible but just to see how much more the game has to offer in terms of um just variants and fights and drafts and everything else it makes me really excited for the future of the game so Thanks for discussing that with us. Do you guys have anything else to add before we move on to the next leg of our show? Yeah, I, I mean, oh well. Before we move on to the next leg, the, the next like might be the item build of the week. I don't know. What do you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was okay. thinking we'd uh, kind of spend the last bit just talking that entirely, so we can just move on to that. I mean, you can preface that. There you go. Transition. Special effects dot P style, man. <laughs> Hashtag production value. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are listening in audio only in the podcast form, uh, it was Jazz Fingers. Jazz Fingers were the special effects. It right, was Wayne's World run. Jazz Fingers. Already. Everyone was like, ah, oh, we missed some good special effects. It's like, no, yeah. just, just Blue doing his thing. Okay, um, so let's talk Family this, show. Let's talk this Alchemist show. build because we saw, we saw this strange kind of... I don't know. A lot's been done with the hero. He's kind of like changed what he does um, entirely. And what gets built on him is also pretty varied. Uh, You see 
different items depending on who's going them. And uh, there was some success, and it was kind of like a middle ground. It felt feels like what we saw the most out of Alchemist in this tournament, and that's like hit between the fighting build and the crazy out there builds everyone did. So I know you wanted to preface that. Blue. Yeah. So um, I don't know. For me, the the item build that I am just going Gaga over is really a build that sounds like it's actually quite traditional um, in terms yeah. of the way Alk was has been played in the past. But it's just we've it's been so long since we've seen him, and it was so refreshing to see him played that way successfully. Um, because I just you know I hearken back to the days that I really got into Dota, and that was around TI three, and you see this you know, very traditional carry and alchemist, um, not typically ran mid, but, t you know, in the carry lane, but him getting items like, you know, Sanjin Yasha, uh, Abyssal Blade, and Assault Curious, and all these attack speed-based items, and armor and strength, and just going crazy on people. Um, so it was really cool to see Miracle do that from the mid lane in his own unique way, using the relatively new items like uh, like a Solar Crest, um, as, as really a central part of the build. So just to preface it, what I've, just so you can understand why it's blown my mind, what I have seen in the last, you know, few months uh, and what I'm used to seeing and what I'm seeing here, you know, what I have seen in terms of uh, a build that's the non-split push Octarine, you know, Radiance, Imanta style build is I've seen guys just go for like a Solar Crest and a Blink Dagger or a Shadow Blade and then you know, pass off an agonims to their carry, which we actually have seen OG do in the past. I think they even did at this tournament where they emphasized, you know, the farm on a tiny, so they would farm up a um, miracle, would farm up a uh, an agonim scepter form, pass it off to like your level nine tiny. You see this little tiny rock just swinging a giant ass tree is hysterical, but um, and we've actually seen that work. We've seen them end games and like. 25 minutes doing that. So I've seen that before. I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, I've seen that in some pub games. And then you, you know, you see your split push Octarine build. But then you see this build where he goes, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Gorgon, because I'm not, my memory is not what it used to be. Uh, he would go Solar Crest, Blink Dagger um, into like Assault Curus or, um, no, into Sanjin Yasha, into like Assault Curus or MKB or Abyssal, depending upon on the, the game. game. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's usually usually that third item is going to be an aura item. So it's usually going to be a Vlad's or, or Vlad's, a yeah. uh, or an assault caress of some kind. Some something that helps your team. And the reason for that is because remember I was talking about Alchemist windowing earlier. He windows very early in the game. And usually when he's ready to fight, he's got like three or four pretty decent items up. His team is just not there. But he, A, he's been sucking up all of the gold all over the map for a little while at that point. And B, he gets so much more gold than they do that his supports are still like level 5. And he's got three items. And he's ready to go, but his supports can't sustain a fight at that stage. So that is one of the reasons why the Radiance is such a popular general idea. Because not only does it cause that attrition, which helps supports stay up, but it also gives that mischance to give them some survivability. Um, the Vlads is another option. Assault Caress is the traditional option that you used to see a lot uh, before Radiance was given the mischance back last two patches and before the Vlads was as much a uh, option for the Alchemist. Um, but yeah, we used to see a lot of the farming Alchemist back in everything up to like 6.78. And I actually did like a little historical perspective on Alchemist, so we don't have to talk about it too much, but if you guys are interested in learning more about Alchemist and the way that he's evolved over time, I wrote something up as Alchemist started to get popular back just after the International with 6.85 on DotaBlast.com called The Pub Difference, Why Your Alchemists Lose You Games. And it has a whole little thing about the uh, history of Alchemist there that's maybe 300 words that kind of encapsulates it pretty well. He's just not in every game pick, and I think a lot of like, For people sure. don't understand that, um, at least below the pro level. Mm -hmm. It's just like, he's always good, no? And then he's like, have 180 GPM or something at the end of the game, and you're like, yeah, that didn't work out for you, did it? But that's very interesting. Check that out, everybody. I know I will. Um, I, I have a f just a small follow-up question to that. Uh, Gorgon, I know you've been a, a major proponent, traditionally, of the... the um, support alchemist right in pubs yeah i think in if pubs. you're gonna run an alchemist in a pub you should probably mm -hmm. run in support because he is he has right. to play with uh, his team 
right? So Alchemist gets a net worth advantage so significant that every time any of his allies dies, even if he plays immaculately, when his allies are dying, his net worth advantage is being leveraged against his own team. His supports are being punished because of his value. And the other thing is that because of the amount of communication that it takes in order to make sure that your supports are ready to fight when that alchemist is ready to fight. So if you wait too long to fight as an alchemist, your opponent's carries that carry harder than you do and fight better than you do when they get items catch up to you effectively. They are ready to go by the time you go. And if you go too early, your team is not ready to go and your team starts to die and that leverages your own net worth against you. So it requires a lot of team coordination to make Alchemist work, which is one of the reasons why we see it played more at like the professional level and more successfully. But also one of the reasons why he's not really even that successful of a hero at the professional level, because he is still very difficult to play effectively. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. just an, uh, like the Ember, you know, in a way, but even oh, yeah. more interesting. But um, I don't know, in my opinion, I feel like Grievals is just a really, really interesting mechanic. You don't see things like that a lot. So it's it's cool to see. Uh, it's cool to see yeah. him back in play because he is an interesting hero to watch. Yeah, it's just a lot of fun, a lot of different variety with him. So it's it's just a nice little flavor to add. Yeah, there is a lot of that right now. Um, with the carries and the supports, I feel like there's a lot of interesting heroes, lots of draw to new players, and um, I know I know it keeps me interested. So uh, I think with that being said, um, we're going to wrap up the show for the week. Um, kind of covered everything we wanted to, and yeah, everyone got everything they wanted to say. Anything else you guys want to add before we close her close her out? Uh, if you guys are interested in more concepts about Frankfurt heroes and teams and how uh, heroes were leveraged by what teams and why, I, I did a pretty decent little retrospective on the Frankfurt Major over at ResurGamers.com. And uh, that, that went up today, and it talks a lot about the stats and, and analyzes them for you. So a lot of stuff that we didn't go over necessarily today, but I think it's interesting stuff. So once again, that's uh, ResurGamers.com. Feel free to go over there and take a look. Awesome. And uh, while you're at it, sorry for the click, everybody. Um, while you're at it, why don't you just tell people where they can find you? Oh, you know what? And if you want to know all the other writing that I do and, and analysis and the casting, you can find me over at The Wonder Cow on Twitter, where you can find a link to that article. And if you go back far enough, the Alchemist article, most of the stuff that I write. Or you want to send them angry tweets like, no, that article is not interesting. Alchemist yeah, is a first pick t- every game. <laughs> I do typically read tweets that are sent to me, and I will respond to them often if you ask me a question, uh, unless it's just you're asking me constant questions and I just don't have time. But yeah, I'm, I, I am fortunately uh, at a point where I don't have like such a name brand recognition like a Toby one. I can actually afford to spend three minutes of my day to respond to people on Twitter. So if you have a question, yeah, shoot it to me on Twitter for sure. Okay. Um, what about you, Blue? Where can people find you? You can find me at MrBlue22 on Twitter and... You can find the YouTube channel, because I feel like I'm the resident YouTube channel plugger of this group, <laughs> youtube.com slash dot ptv1. You can find this show, actually the recording, right, of this, uh, of this uh, cast, and I, what seems like it's going to be future casts of not just Try Hard Tuesdays, but Theorycraft Thursdays. Uh, you'll see the replays for sure, um, and the Monday and uh, Wednesday show, I mean... Speaking of the Wednesday show, uh, do we want to plug that a little bit more? Um, sure. Um, what I know about it is it's uh, Woodshrew, who used to uh, do quite a lot of writing for Join Dota. Woodshrew uh, is my spirit animal. Yeah, he's a very cool guy. Um, lots of people in this community know him or know of him. So him and Korean Barbecue, who works as a translator for some of these events for, um, is it Chinese teams or Korean teams? Chinese, Chinese teams. Chinese, yeah. Chinese teams, that's right. How so, dare you? It's just the name. Uh, Where the it's name funny. It's name. cute that you imply that there are Korean teams that matter. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. Maybe they'll be better than all of us in the game in just a couple years, though. Well, That's right. Give the, them time. The learning curve is crazy. Korean but, overlords. Um, they're doing a pro Dota-centric show on Wednesdays, guys. So tune in and check that out. I do not know the name. Um, I just know it's going to be very good. So um, they're, they're very talented. Uh, and they're very talented. So I've I've worked yeah. very closely with both of them from my time at Join Dota and elsewhere, and I I can say like both those guys know what they're talking about. Awesome, can't yeah, wait to tune worth, in. Uh, they are worth watching. And um, as for me, you can find me um, at dot p underscore wazoo on Twitter. Um, uh, yeah, I don't really have anything going on. I do this show that you tuned into, so thank you. And um, Gorgon, thank you for joining us. 
It's my pleasure. I, I feel like I hogged the mic a little bit today, but it's all right because we were having fun and talking Frankfurt. We like Mike Hogs on the show because yeah, better you <laughs> hogging it than us. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> our hogging. Who knows? But um, we had a great time having you on, and we will um, see everybody next week. Uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, stay classy and stay hard, of course. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Oh yeah, family show. Family. Wait, show. before we stop, this Be is thankful. a family show. We have to find out what we're thankful for. Okay. Good. I'm glad I didn't press the button there. I am thankful for a wonderful .p family, but also um, I'm thankful for incredibly dynamic game such as Dota 2 that keeps me entertained and like staying up like a kid on Saturday morning until 4 a.m. Like just losing it at how cool it is. Okay. What are you thankful for, Gorgon? Uh, I am thankful for OG's victory so that uh, I can flaunt it in people who told me I was a fool for cheering for them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I am thankful for a new patch coming out because that is my bread and butter, you know? Yeah, that'll be fun to talk to you on here. We'll book you before anyone else does. So show up to your house and black bag you, drive you to the <laughs> studio. <laughs> Analyze this. <laughs> yeah. The That's Batman basically what Join Dota did to me for the last couple of years, yeah. right? Because I would go on Join Dota, I would get a full patch analysis thing up within the two hours after the patch came out. Yeah. So it was Except Toby Wan in the back going like, where's the OP hero? Yeah, it's, it's like Where Alistrix in, in the back with just a whip. <laughs> <laughs> Give me ten things that matter! <laughs> yeah, no, it was good. Good times. What are you think for, thankful for, Blue, besides me? Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, God. Slide that in there. Yeah. I'm thankful the for... For uh, for Cyphus for supporting your honky ass throughout uh, our .dot p uh, tryhards uh, tournament run, um, our league run. It was it was a fun time, and I'm glad we had it. Uh, I'm also thankful to uh, Fafnir for so that um, because when we pub, uh, I'm not the asshole in games. Um, <laughs> uh, so thank you, Faf. Shout out to you, pal. Um, and you know what? I'm thankful to my beautiful wife for putting up with me for all these years and and for for not yelling at me when i'm just blabbing on and on for hours on end talking about this goddamn game that just won't seem to leave her life even though i went to fucking seattle to do it to like live it and breathe it for babe winter river and lane. so exactly right <laughs> shouting about the nerdiest crap she yeah. could ever imagine um i'm also thankful for big daddy no tail for delivering you know on his promise to win and win big um i, I love that man team no tail shirt in the background check it out dot p folks see that's why you should watch the videos for things like that yeah uh, and of course the jazz hands and of it's course the jazz hands jazz. wayne's world jazz hands like I, lucas I'm arts for, level special for effects. having hands to be able to do that and you know what i think i've run out of things to be thankful for done wow you're a very thankful for person all right well i'm glad we did not forget that um so oh, thanks and for our non-american audiences for that that we have thanksgiving coming up so yeah. if you're canadian and or anything other than american and that didn't make any sense to you retrospective go back and listen to it now that you know it's a holiday thing and of course right. my our lovely viewers we're also thankful for you very thankful so uh stay classy stay hard eat some turkey see ya